Welcome to episode five of Ripple Live. Thanks for joining us, all you out there in the Final Cut Pro 10 community. We're glad to have you join us. I'm Steve Martin, and I'm here with my buddy, Mark Spencer, and we're here to answer your questions and show you some cool tips and workflows. So Mark, how are you doing? Hey, Steve. I'm great. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You survive all that uh, snow you guys got last week. Uh, yeah, we, we call it here. The, we call it here the snow snow apocalypse. How how was it? Like yeah. four feet deep. I don't know. I was like, uh, yeah. Two feet. yeah, it wasn't that bad. And people probably laugh at us in Michigan when I said two feet. But anyway, yeah, for Arizona where we are, it's it's kind of it was kind of a lot. So yeah, we're doing yeah, great. It's all melting off now. Good. Yeah, we got we got tons of rain. In fact, a place near us got twenty inches of rain in forty eight hours. Uh, so it's been crazy, a lot of flooding. It's just been nuts here. But we're here to uh, talk about Final Cut Pro and related topics. Ripple Live is a show all about uh, answering your questions and showing you some tips about Final Cut Pro 10 and related products. So the chat window is where you can communicate with us and we will attempt to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Sometimes it goes by pretty quickly. If you wanna make sure your question gets answered, and or you just want to contribute to support the show, there's a little dollar sign there at the bottom. If you click it, you can contribute a nominal amount, which helps support our show. We appreciate it very much. Oh, of course, Purchasing Tutorial does the same thing. So thank you for that. Um, but feel free to ask any question. We'll answer as many as we can. Um, and to get started, we're actually going to go back to the last show. We try to pick up on questions we weren't able to answer during the show. And uh, there were a bunch of questions about audio metering, so Steve is going to tackle a little bit about that just to get us started. Right, so let's just talk about audio metering as a kind of a general principle. So in the past, you'd uh, monitor levels, just levels, not loudness. Now, levels would be monitored using either a peak meter, of which Final Cut Pro has a peak meter built in, or use a RMS uh, metering, which basically averages out short segments of your program. So you can get it, it essentially averages your volume. So it's kind of like loudness, but not quite. It just deals with levels. But around, I don't want to say 2011-ish, if you do uh, do some research, I think the um, European Broadcasting Union said enough. We, we need a loudness standard because all of us can attest to the fact that we're watching late night television and then, you know, Bob's car commercial comes on, it's really loud and we have to like turn it down and then we have to, and then bring it back up when our program comes on. And so this whole idea of LUFS as a standard developed by the EBU, it's a ITU standard and uh, you can read more about it if you want, but the LUFS standard is more about a, a perceived, how we humans perceive sound. So for example, if you're listening to a piece of jazz and then you're listening to a you know dubstep right after you know there's going to be a, a fairly wide variance in your in the perceived loudness. Now Luffs will deal with that so that the loudness over both of those two pieces of music will be relatively normalized. Um, in terms of broadcast, broadcasters have been doing this for a while. Um, the Luff standard has been uh, basically I. I Look, you can read up about it because every platform has their own kind of LUFT standard. Um, like for broadcasting, I think it's like minus 20, minus 21 to minus 25. And then YouTube has their own, Spotify has their own. So you definitely want to check the specs for your mastering. I, all that to say, it's a, it's a subject worth diving into. But the question last, last time was, how do I monitor LUFTs in Final Cut? And we had some great feedback from, from some users. I uh, wanted to thank Edgar Davis, Jerry Thompson, and Simon Pines. They gave us some, they sent me some links after the fact of some really great uh, LUFS metering plugins. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bring those up in a moment. But let's uh, take a quick look on Final Cut Pro on how you do it just using kind of the built-in plugins. And then I'll show you some of the plugins that they recommended. So let's uh, jump over to Final Cut for a second. Let's go see. Here I have a, a program that's got dialogue, music, and effects. And if you're going to meter this and you want to have it output at the correct level, you really want to be monitoring kind of the combined mix of all your DM&E tracks or stems or whatever you're calling them. Um, so in this case, you're going to want to select everything and then uh, make a compound clip. I'll just call this final mix. And um, I'll just do that and return and now I'll get a compound clip where I have separate uh, dialogue 
music and effects subroll lanes. Now, to apply LUFS metering, uh, you just open up the effects browser and you'll go under, the, under it's under the specialty category uh, down here under, under audio, under the audio plugins, you'll see specialized. Uh, you want to add what's called the multimeter and the multimeter is going to be needed to add it to the, in this case, the top level of the compound club because this is where your final mix is coming out of right there. It's everything's being summed into that compound clip. So, um, so I have the multimeter applied and I open the inspector. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. And here you have your multimeter, you have your analyzer. And by the way, you can set this to different like percentages for viewing. And I, I think it's best to look at it hundred percent. You could really see it. But over here on this side, you have LUFS. So this is your loudness metering. And over here you have your RMS and your peak metering, and that would be your level metering. So if I go ahead and play this, I'll just go ahead and spit the space bar. You can see that my peak metering is about, here it says it's about minus eight, minus nine, right here. And then I have my RMS is minus 18, but then I have my LUFS metering over here, which is hitting around like minus 21, minus 22, which is, depending on who you're delivering to, that, that might be fine, but you have to uh, you know, look at that specific uh, spec sheet Bible to be sure, but there you have your LUFS metering. It's a fairly basic analyzer, but there's the built-in LUFS meter, and we talked about that last time. But there are tools that have a little bit more uh, robustness in terms of features than, than this one. But, you know, it is free and it's built-in. I just show you, showed you where it is. Um, I'm going to uh, pause this for a moment. I'm going to jump out to my browser for a second. And by the way, everything I'm going to show you, uh, I, I've included links for in the description. So you don't have to remember where these, you just click. So like this one is a really good, uh, nice one. It's a, it's about, it's 49 euro, 65 US. And this is a levels meter that does a lot of really cool stuff. You can, uh, it monitors, it monitors peak and stereo. It monitors a bunch of different stuff. And I, I actually really like this one. I haven't had a chance to play with a lot of these yet, but here's one of them. Um, here's another one. Let's see here. Uh, la this is one called, uh, uh, you know, so this is this is from a company called Klangfund. So I, that's trying trying my German out. Klangfund. <laughs> it's a Luffs meter. It's forty nine dollars. You can play with that. Some of these work within Final Cut. Some of them work standalone. And the one that was really interesting to me, and I haven't played with this, is this one called Loudness Change. And uh, this is one's from Simon Pines. And this is a this is really an interesting one where you just mix to your ear and you just mix and you look arm you just mix to your ear and then you run your audio through this thing called loudness change and you you, you put in a luffs target and it'll figure it out the luffs the, the, the proper luffs uh, level for you and then render out a, a new audio track based on that luffs target uh, according to simon he's used this in the uk and uh i forget what what broadcast he was dealing with but he said it pa it passed and it worked great so this is, so I wanted to let you know about that. So again, um, all the links uh, for these different LUFS meters are in, in the description below. And also, if you want more of a kind of, if you want more of a description about what, what LUFS are and what they're meeting, I also put two links down there from YouTube to excellent, excellent explanations um, on, on, this, on this metering type. So Thank thanks, you, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. God, I, I LUFS it. I love it too. <laughs> hey, so I, a couple of a couple of questions that came in while you were talking there. One is uh, from uh, the Spank Man, and we won't Spank go into Man. where that thing came from. Uh, but uh, thank thank you very much for your contribution, Spank Man. And he had a question about um, archiving, and you he only wants to archive some of the clips on his camera card, not all of them. Now, Steve, you did a MacBreak Studio about this a while ago, and I, I just in order to be efficient, I just posted a link to your MacBreak Studio that talks exactly about how to make a camera archive that doesn't include all the media or delete certain media out of it uh, in, in the chat window there. So um, Spankman, take a look at that and see if that answers your question. I think it should. Yeah, it does. Uh, it it'll another, completely answer his question, yeah. No, no, that's, that's, that's the video. Just watch that. We don't even need to explain it. That's the video. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, there was a question about to view 360 content, what VR glasses do you use or recommend? So mm -hmm. um, two, two, two things about that. Um, and Steve, feel free to jump in this. If you want to be able to view 360 content while you're editing in Final Cut Pro 10, there's only one uh, device on the market right now that does that, which Robin mentioned down below there, which is the the, the HTC Vive yep. that allows you to you know look at it while you're editing and work on it. Um, but if that's not critical to you, and it hasn't been for me for the stuff that I do, I use, and so does Steve, the um, the Oculus Go from Facebook. Because it's fantastic. There, he's got it right with the little googly eyes, which that's a little <laughs> add-on. I love that. I, I, added these be, I added these because most people look ridiculous with these, and this will even make you even look more ridiculous. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we both, we both love, we each have one of these, and um, I create, you know, we both shoot 360 material with different cameras, we, with Fusion camera or whatever, and uh, then view it on that device. And it's great because it's, it's inexpensive. It's not tethered to anything. It doesn't require a phone. You can sideload your content directly into it or you can stream it. It's a, it's a great device. And there is there's so much fascinating 360 content out there right now that it, it, if, it just even if you're not into creating it, just consuming it, it's a really amazing experience. And to me, the Oculus Go is the first device that makes it fast and easy to do it in a way that you can share with other people. You can take and give to other people and have them use it. So some really fantastic material out there. In fact, um, the uh, Free Solo uh, with Alex Canole that just won the Oscar for the best documentary feature, and it's the most, if you haven't seen it in IMAX, God, it's amazing, but there's also a piece in that you can watch on the Oculus Go in 360 that will make your hands sweat like crazy. Um, yeah, in fact, yeah, we're gonna watch. I, want to, I wanted to see that on the big screen. I would love to see that in IMAX, uh, but you know, I, I yep. you were telling me about it's a great great movie. Excellent. Uh, okay. Um, what next? Uh, I could do a tip. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I will share my screen. Start sharing and uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. Great. So my tip is about uh, bringing, restoring sync audio or, or bringing audio back from the dead. And I'm going to do a little bit of setup about this. And uh, the basic idea that I'm going to use in this scenario, it works anywhere, but my scenario is I have some interview footage and I have some B-roll that I want to cut to it. And this is something that happens to me, and that's why I'm using this as, as, an, ex, as a, an example. So we have some, you know, an interview bit that I've already edited into the timeline, and I want to cut some B-roll to it. And this, this first few steps are just a little bit of setup. Um, so let's say I want to cut some B-roll. She's talking about dancing, and I have a well-organized library here that has keyword collections, so I can go straight to this Dance Studio keyword collection. So I've even got favorites identified. So I can just select that favorite range, or I could filter by favorites. I'm going to press Q, and I'm going to press Q again for this one to do a couple connect edits. Now, you look at this and like, well, when I made these connect edits, they included audio because that happens by default. In this case, I really don't want the audio to be included with this B-roll because this audio has music in the dance studio uh, and other sounds. You can see it. I'm not going to play it. You're not going to be able to hear it anyway, but you can just see by the waveform that there's audio included with these clips. And in this case, I don't want that. And it can frequently be the case when you're adding B-roll to interview footage where that B-roll doesn't have good audio, either there's a lot of wind noise or it's like from a drone or there's some sense, instance where you don't want the audio. It's like, what do you do? So one option, oh, you just drag this line down to get rid of it or I'll undo that or you could select both clips and go to the inspector, command four and bring the volume all the way down there. And that's fine, but you don't want to do that. Really the best thing to do is um, go to this little pop-up menu here and choose to make video only edits or use this keyboard shortcut, Shift-2. So when I select that, this little icon changes, and there's a little person there now that means it's video only. So now if I edit in my audio, um, any audio that has video, let me, uh, I'm sorry, any video that has audio, now there's no audio coming in. Okay, that's not the tip. That's just a quick setup. 
By the way, another quick setup is you're wondering how I can see these audio waveforms in the browser. There's an option under the clip appearance pop-up menu here to turn those waveforms on, which I found very useful to see in the browser. So that's just a little bit of setup. Here's my tip. Once you've done that, you're editing B-roll in and you've changed your editing option to video only, I often forget that I did that. So let's say I'm going back and now I want to add some more interview footage. So I'll go to my interview keyword collection and I can see this favorite I've already included this bit, but I because a little orange tells me the used media range, but this bit I haven't. So I'm going to select and hit E and then I'll go select another one and I'll just this favorite range. I'll hit E and this one as well, just the favorite range. Um, and I'll hit E for that one as well. I'm a little trouble selecting it, so I'll go to favorites only and put it in that way. So now we look at my timeline. You know, I'm working away, I cut that stuff in, I'm not paying attention because I'm listening to the audio up in the browser, and then I go, wait a minute, I've got all of this, uh, all these clips in my timeline now that don't have audio. Uh, and let's say it's too late to undo because I've moved on to other things and I come back to this and I'm like, oh God, what did I do? I've got no audio for these clips. How can I get the audio back? And you might think, well, I've got to go find that clip and I've got to figure out what the range was, blah, blah, blah. There's a super easy way to replace these clips with the version that has the audio. And the key is the word to replace these clips, okay? So what I'm gonna do with the playhead anywhere on this clip, it doesn't matter where, uh, and it doesn't need to be selected, I'm gonna use two keyboard shortcuts that will fix this problem. The first keyboard shortcut is Shift and the F key, which will basically do a find in the browser or a match frame. So when I press Shift F, you can see that it found that exact clip and it selected the exact same range of what's been put into my timeline. Now you need to make sure you're back here set to all before you do the next step. Um, and now we do a replace edit and the keyboard shortcut for that, right? Don't drag the clip in and wait for the pop-up menu. That's just a waste of time. Option and the R key, R for replace. And it's done, all right? Command two to select the timeline, press the down arrow for the next clip and then shift F, option R. Command two for the timeline, down arrow, shift F, option R. So just a really quick way that you can restore your audio, your sync audio along with your clips if you've managed, like I do, to um, add clips that, that don't have the audio in the timeline. And that's my tip. Awesome. That's a great tip, Mark. So we had some questions uh, come in while you were demoing that. And um, I wanna address Andy's question. We'll get to your uh, Question, Bob, thank you so much for the super chat, chat donation. Um, Andy, uh, you were asking, what is Ripple using for long-term video archive? LTO, buy more drives? Well, that's a really good question. Um, well, first, firstly, uh, LTO is, is a tape mechanism. So you're storing it on a linear tape, just like videotape of the old days. It's just writing data linearly to a tape. It's actually the cheapest solution. Um, I just, while we were, while, while Mark was presenting, I was looking up the cost per gigabyte. It's actually the cheapest, like an LTO six tape. It's like 0.8 cents per gigabyte, or it's down to like, yeah, as of, well, this is an older one. I don't know what it is, but it's like cents per, cents per gigabyte. It's really, really low. Um, and you can get up to, I think, what was the last time? Six terabytes. Maybe it's, it's, it's larger capacities now. Uh, so in terms of Cheap storage LTO is a bet, better way to go. It's just not fast, and you got to use a lot of tape. So if you're backing up, you know, t you know, five terabytes, you're going to be plugging in a lot of tapes into that machine, and uh, then you're going to have to keep the tapes on the shelf, and then you're going to have to plug them back in, and then take them, take the data off each tape, you know, as you, uh, you know, from each tape to get all of your uh, data reconstituted on your hard drive. So all that to say. <laughs> Which one do we do? We don't use LTO tape. We just have <laughs> right. a really big ass like RAID drive <laughs> that uh, we built a we built a, a Synology. We went to Amazon. We built a box and we just with like eight bays and we just put big drives in it when we need more space. And it's interesting with that. Like over time, we start seeing stuff that we haven't opened for like two years. It's gone. We delete it and we just. At the end of every year, we look at, okay, what stuff do we want to archive? What stuff can we just actually get rid of? Like, for example, like all our Mac break, and then we 
And then we also have a smaller backup of the raid. So um, that's what we that's what we use. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. Sure. Um, so because I'm installing those those little drives is you can see the little connector on this is a Thunderbolt connected uh, device. That's a Seagate device that is used. I can drop any drive into this three and a half or two and a half drive and and use it for editing, uh, but also just to spin them up and test them. So that's my sort of cheap archiving solution. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Steve, there was a question that came in. We asked Scramble, we'll get to you in just a second, from Bob Brydeen, which I thought was kind yeah. of interesting. I hope yeah. I'm saying your name right. A way to modify the color balance when shooting continuously from one ambient light condition to another, such as an exterior to an interior shot, when using fixed color balance in the camera. Well, if you have a fixed color balance in the camera, uh, you're going to have a problem. Right. Yeah. If you're shooting inside and your color balance to inside and you go to outside, the color balance is not going to be correct or vice versa. Right. So your, your options are either to allow the camera to adjust color balance automatically, let it float or to fix it in post. And Steve, you can comment on this as well, but you can fix it in post by animating your keyframe corrections, um, which you can do in Final Cut. You can set keyframes on your on your color correction in order to have it change as you move from one environment to another. It used to be you couldn't keyframe it, you just had to create a, a blade. You, you cut the clip when you transition and you create two separate grades on either side, like inside and outside, and then you use that cross dissolve to sort of cross between them. And actually, sometimes that works a little faster and easier than keyframing the color correction. Yeah. Uh, but that would be my recommendation is one of the two, either let the thing float or, or, or fix it in post. Yeah, and just a comment on it really depends on how good your camera is in terms of circuitry, in, ter in terms of getting that, yeah. uh, that shift from, let's say, kind of a cooler to a warmer or warmer to cooler, depending yeah, good on point. your direction. Like my Canon, my Canon camera actually is really good at that. If it's on AWB out of white balance, it's pretty good. I, we normally like to lock white balance, um, but if you know you're going to be moving from inside out, why not? I mean, if, if you have a good camera and you trust the circuitry, I've done it and I've been pretty happy with it. And uh, if notwithstanding that, then use the, the two techniques that Mark just just uh, uh, and if outlined. you're not going too fast, right? Because you've if you're if you're moving quickly from one environment to another, you're going to see the adjustment happen in the camera. If it's right. if it's set to uh, to do auto white balance, you're going to see that change, and you're going to need to deal with that, which is going to be more difficult to deal with, frankly, than having it just stay fixed and and color correcting it after the fact. So you just you need to move slowly from one environment to another. So it really depends on the situation. Yeah. Okay, so there was another question in here. Right. Uh, Scrambler the Sea Wolves yeah. there. He said, yeah, Scrambler the Sea Wolves. Oh, wait, <laughs> Scrambler the Sea Wolves has a video that he did. I think he sent a link to us, and it's pretty awesome. We, I haven't had a chance to watch oh, it yes, yet. Yes, that's right. No, no, no. Well, it's not, you, you can't see it yet. It's not right. out. It's not um, out. But there was a whole article about it. It looks really great. Yeah. So his question, actually two questions. I'm doing a hike. Whitney, with my brothers, do you recommend a 360 camera or just straight GoPro HD? Also have either of you use KeyPro Flow and can you demo with a new upgrade? Uh, let's uh, let's take those in reverse order. Um, I've played with KeyPro, KeyPro, I can't say it today, KeyPro Flow. <laughs> wow. Um, German. <laughs> yes. The idea is it's a uh, personal asset manager. So the idea is you bring it into Keyflow, Keyflow Pro and you tag everything and you organize it. And then uh, it works with Final Cut Pro. In fact, it's an extension. I think I haven't, it works as an Apple uh, Final Cut Pro extension. Uh, I, I haven't really used, you know, it's really interesting that, that that's something we've been meaning to do because we, we deal with like a lot of assets here at our company from tutorials to stock footage. I just don't have enough experience with it. I know people that deal with a lot of media love it. Um, so yeah, so I don't I don't have enough experience with it to, to really comment other than that's something we're looking at in the future. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely look at that. So in terms of, unless you had a comment about it, Mark. And... No, 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 go ahead. We can both talk about the whole Fusion versus uh, GoPro, regular GoPro thing. It's yeah, a good question. Um, so I'm a big fan of, well, I have both a GoPro and I have a GoPro Fusion. 
And I honestly, I my go, normal GoPro just stays in my bag now. It really does. And and there's a main reason for that. With a 360 camera, it's like two GoPros, like you know, one strapped to the other, and you're really getting 180 this side, 180 this side. What I like about it is that I don't have to think about where the camera is pointed. I just you know hold it out, and it just it's capturing everything. And a lot of times, especially when I go on like family vacations, is like. I'm never in my own videos because it's always pointed at somebody else. With a 360 camera now, I'm in my videos. My daughter's with me. My son's with me. I can, and then I can choose what portion of the sphere I want to use. So absolutely, without a doubt, 360 camera, uh, I, would, I would take and, and, and do that with. Because not only will you get a 360 experience, right. but then you can cut it in and just window it in a 1080. And it's, it's just fantastic. Um, so I, I'll, let me, I'll add a caveat to that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just I, I, so I was just going to say I, I was just I was just showing I, I've got, got one right here, and um, the only caveat I'll add to that is anything you're shooting with that fusion camera is going to take you a lot of time in post. Um, uh, so yep. it depends how much it depends how much footage you're shooting. If you're shooting a lot of stuff, you know I I I, I like to be selective about what I do with that fusion camera because it's going to take a lot of time to download. It's going to take a lot of time to to process. Uh, and then if you're going to create, uh, you know, standard HD video out of it, just making the choices and doing the editing is fun, but it's it's time consuming to choose your angles and choose if you're going to go to Tiny Planet and then unwrap and you can do some really great stuff with it. But man, tons of disk space, tons of time. So you really want to balance, OK, how much 360 you're going to shoot versus how much you're going to time spend in your in your hotel room, uh, you know, editing and processing versus uh going out and enjoying yourself. Well, this is this is why, uh, uh, let's, there's another 360 camera. If I were to do it all over again, I would buy this other camera. Actually, um, wait, wait, I'm not sure about that. Well, <laughs> there's a camera out right now. Because <laughs> I love, I'm kind of a 360 geek. I like collect 360 cameras. But there's a camera out now by Insta360 called Insta360, Insta360. 1X. That camera uh -huh. is far and away the best 360 camera. It's small form factor. In that price it has it, it has one of the best apps ever. It processes, you can process it and stitch it in the app. You can actually track people on the app. You can do windowing. You can, um, it does slow-mo. Everything I've seen with it is extremely impressive. It do, the biggest problem with the GoPro is like Mark said, the workflow is a freaking nightmare. It just is. <laughs> um, the GoPro Insta 361 is not. You can you can literally come down off the mountain or wherever your vacation and just and do it all on your phone and then post it, or you could spit out if you want. You can connect it to computer, but I'm I'm kind of sold on the Insta 361 only because the workflow is so much easier. Yeah, but that's a the really harder question that's is really if I was going to take a 360 versus a standard 360, hands down for me. So, <laughs> all right. So any more questions that popped up during the okay. All right. Any more questions there? Um, yeah. Bob Rydeen thinks that the Insta 361 is better yeah. than the Fusion. Yeah. yeah. And the, yeah, the Fusion is around seven or 800 bucks here. Is that right? I can't remember now. It's, I'm, no, it's, exactly... it's, it's, it's around 500 now. But the, 500, the, okay. yeah, the Insta 361 is around 400. So it's the Insta 361 is still cheaper um, yeah. than, than the GoPro Fusion. So Simo Harjain asks, what is your ideal plugin for color correction? And what do you think of Mac Magic Bullet looks? It's a great plugin. Um, um, if you want, yes. uh, yeah, go ahead. So go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I think the plugin, Red Giant, those guys um, make some great stuff. It's just, to, look, to me, Magic Bullet looks is just another tool in your toolbox. Uh, I like it because mm -hmm. you have a bunch of presets. You can start applying to them. They're... Uh, kind of like LUTs, you don't have to like search for hundreds of different LUTs to apply. They're, they're just there and they're, the interface is really nice, the UI. And if you want to not spend a lot of time coming up with, let's say, a commercial look or a film look or a ble bleach bypass look or whatever look that's, you know, Vogue right now, great product. And then you could still tweak them to your liking. So I'm a big fan. And I would, I just want to address, you know, so Robin has mm -hmm. been very helpful. Uh, if you guys don't know Robin, he's jumping in and, and answering other questions is great. 
sometimes people don't uh, know that, that Robin can come across as a little bit harsh, and I know he doesn't mean to be. It's just just the way he talks. So you know, don't don't take anything personal there. He's asking some good questions, and it is a you know you don't necessarily need a plug in for color correction. The, the tools in Final Cut are excellent, uh, especially as of the update a few uh, a little while ago, because you've got color wheels, you've got the color board, you've got uh, color curves, hue saturation curves. You've got like everything, shape masks, color masks, uh, a very deep set. You should be able to do anything you need to do in there. Uh, that being said, sometimes people like plugins because it just gives you a look uh, and you don't need to work to do the color grading. Um, I kind of like to say that my favorite plugin for Final Cut Pro 10 for color correction is DaVinci Resolve. <laughs> Only because there's a few <laughs> because there's a there's a few things you can do in DaVinci Resolve that you can't do in Final Cut. And it, it, Final Cut does 90% of what I needed to do, but sometimes I need uh, more specific tracking or or just a little bit more uh, control and DaVinci Resolve has been a, you know, a it does more than color correction, but it was designed originally as a color corrector and its tool set is is outstanding and it's you know, for most of what you need, it's free it, it, um, up to UHD. So I do most of everything in Final Cut. I usually don't use plugins at all, but for certain things, I'll go to DaVinci Resolve to uh, get access to some more tools in there. <laughs> Robin, <laughs> harsh. <laughs> no, we love you, Robin. Uh, here, Sean says, it's time to upgrade my machine. Do I pick an iMac Pro or wait for the new Mac Pro? That, well, that's that's always the question, right? <laughs> like, if you, there's always going to be something new coming out, and usually, immediately after you buy something is when it, it comes out. So, uh, a very hard question. That it goes back to what you need and how soon you need it. If you need it now, buy it now. You know, if you knew for sure this new Mac Pro is coming out in a week or a month or something then yeah, wait, but that's, there's no, we don't know for we sure. No that's, idea, that's, yeah. that's, that weighs out. It could be the end of the year. So I would say the iMac Pro is an excellent machine. It's outstanding. And you know, if you've got need for that, get it now, do your work and the new one comes out, decide if you need that new machine or not. And you, you know, sell your machine and upgrade. But my, my general approach is not to constantly be following technology and like, wait, there's a new one coming out. Just like, there's so much great stuff out there right now in terms of Mac hardware, in terms of great cameras, the 360 cameras, and it's all changing really rapidly. But I, I think you buy the best thing that's out there now for what you need and you work with it. And don't worry about like, oh, something better came out. So what? You can do great work with what you just got. And you know, people get a little too tied up into having the latest and greatest widget and not just focusing on making great, telling great stories with the tools that they have. Pers personal opinion on that. So uh, Brian uh, Sigmiller asked a question, when creating a two pop for FCP 10, is the setup the same for 23.9 versus 29.97? Um, boy, I haven't, well, first of all, what is a two pop? <laughs> well, <laughs> this, hmm, how do I describe, describe it? Well, um, it was, I, in. If we apply it to like film, it was that last pop in the projector. To, uh, I don't want to go back that far. In broadcast, <laughs> in broadcast, it was literally the frame exactly two seconds prior to start a picture. So if the picture started at like one hour straight up for broadcast. The two pop would be exactly two seconds, fifty-eight point whatever, um, and that's where the pop would be. And so broadcaster, that would that so from that point forward, that would be a uh, where the the program would start. In the past, it was used for synchronization, but it's not used for that anymore. But your question: uh, Do you set up the same for twenty nine nine seven as you twenty three nine eight? Um, well, you have different frame rates. Well, one's thirty, and essentially one's twenty four. So, and I did a an episode. Um, there's a yeah. Go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead. I was just going to say one second is one second, whether it's 2398 or 2997. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, uh, I, did a, I did a tutorial on this in under five. If you go to our under five and type in uh, Kratom custom countdown slates, you'll see it in there. I actually build the slate with a two pop. So check that out. Is there anything else you want to um, add with that question? No, I just wanted to give folks a reminder. We've got a lot of questions coming in. If you want to, uh, 
if you want to either contribute to support the show or just make sure your question gets answered, click that little dollar sign and make a nominal donation, and uh, we'll we'll try to make sure we get to your question. We really appreciate the support that you guys uh, give us to allow us to do the show. Um, there was a question about Steve. I think you could answer this. Um, I think you'd like to because he's asking <laughs> about using the i the uh, iPad in combination with the Final Cut Pro 10. It's from Brady Wirtz, who says, any tips on how to integrate an iPad into Final Cut Pro 10 workflow? Seems like a great tool, but I'm not sure to take advantage of it. And I know you use an iPad, so maybe uh, yeah. you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, it, it really depends on what you need the iPad for. Right now, I'm using it as a separate display. Uh, I think last week, or last episode, I talked about this this plugin called Duet. It turns your iPad into a secondary display. So I'm I'm, I'm looking at my iMac Pro here, and I'm looking at a secondary display here on my iPad Pro. So right there, that's a, a huge reason to have an iPad. Uh, but I used to use iPad for other things. Um, I'm going to be talking about this later. Actually, I could talk about it now. I was going to do a tech tip, but um, might as well just go ahead and cover it now. Another re way I use the iPad is I record my my audio voiceovers, and I, can, and I record interviews directly into my iPad using an app called Twisted Wave. And then there's plenty of different audio apps out there. This is not to say the one I just mentioned is the, is the right one. There are plenty of them. But here's the thing, I, I, use, this little, I use this little box. It's called the iRig. It's called the iRig Pro. And it has a lightning connector. And I just plug this right into the iPad. By this way, this also works with an iPhone. Plug it right into my iPad. And it's got, a, it's got an XLR input, so you can connect professional audio, a lav mic or a boom mic. It has a uh, potentiometer, a pot, as they say. And, and this is the most important part of all. It has a headphone jack because you can well, with the iPad, you can certainly monitor using the headphone jack on the iPad. But if you're using this with an iPhone, there is no headphone jack. It's just this. So you need a way to monitor your level, and that's where, that's where this comes in. So I use this. And in fact, I just use it. Mark and I were in LA, and we were working on some tutorials, and Travis says, I need some audio pickups. I just threw this in my bag and I, you know, my little um, my microphone, just threw it in there. And when I got in the hotel, I just plugged this into my iPad and just recorded. And then using Twisted Wave, I just hit the little button, uploaded to Dropbox. My editor had it and was ready to go. So that's another way I use the iPad. The third way I use the iPad is for graphics. You need to catch the, um, the Mac break where I did two episodes, Mac break 553. I, uh, anyway, it's a two, one, two of them back where I show how to create custom hand-drawn graphics on the iPad. And you could use any number of graphics applications, Infinity Photo, um, Adobe Sketch. I use Adobe Sketch in the Mac break. And I use the iPad to draw a bunch of stuff and I create lower thirds with it. And then the last thing I use the iPad for, and I, I'm, I wanna do more of this in the future, I play the piano and I know Mark plays the guitar. I like to use it for recording instru like MIDI instruments. So if I want to do it, if I, I'm experimenting with some songs or GarageBand, I'll plug in, you know, a MIDI instrument and then use, use my, my keypad to, to work out some different arrangements or whatnot. So those are the four reasons I use it. There's probably a number of other reasons, but those, those are the main ones. So, um, yeah. Way, Excellent. That, that episode on graphics? Yeah. Episode 450. Yeah, so it's episode 450 um, on graphics. So I like to, yeah, I think iPad's a great, great tool. All right, um, let's see, a couple more. I have a Simo Harjane, sorry if I pronounced your, wrong, your name incorrectly, Simo says, Mark, when are you gonna come up with a new Apple Motion training book with completely new features and contents? Uh, well, if there were completely new features in Motion to talk about, uh, you know, <laughs> I would do that, but uh, just a couple comments on that. So, so first of all, um, I, you know, I've really moved my focus from books to, to uh, online tutorials with Ripple training. And the reason for that is multifold. Uh, part of it is that the software development cycle uh, doesn't match the book production cycle, which simply means by the time a book comes out, it's out of date. It doesn't make sense to me to, to do a big book about software when the features change so fast. Uh, I also find that uh, we've just found by just delivering our content as online tutorials, we can get information out that's faster, that's more relevant, and you have project media, and you can people like to watch us do that. So anyway, my motion tutorials are all up to date pretty much on, on uh, Ripple Training's website. And um, 
The second comment is there hasn't been a lot of change that we see in motion uh, in, a, in a while. The last big thing was adding 3D text. Uh, recently, all of the color correction tools that are in Final Cut Pro 10, like color curves and hue saturation curves um, and color wheels, those are all available now in, in motion. Um, which is a nice addition. There's been a few other comic book effect and a few other little things, but nothing really major that would warrant a, a brand new tutorial because there haven't been like, you know, big new features in that product for a while. So, uh, I, you know, I use motion all the time. I find it extremely useful. I just did a tutorial last week when we were, Steve and I were in LA doing a training last week and I did a, 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 a tutorial about how to use motion to create a transition. I'm actually going to do a follow-up on that. So I use it all the time that, um, most of my training is is currently up to date and we're doing more sort of under fives and things like that to communicate to people how to use motion. Um, and if there's brand new features, you know, we'll have new tutorials out for it for sure. Okay, so a couple of other questions I look back that we might have missed. Uh, Jeremy Heberly, is there a quick way to get from After Effects or from Motion to Final Cut, like with Dynamic Link for Adobe? Um, there is no, well, what, what do we mean by dynamic link? We simply mean like, for example, you would have a motion project in Final Cut Pro, like of a lower third or something. And then from right within the clip in the timeline, you would open motion, make changes, and then those changes would appear on the clip in the timeline. There is no feature like that in Final Cut Pro 10. So uh, Final Cut Pro 10, the way they handle it is like, no, you go into motion, you publish like Mark was saying, you publish something really cool. Like he was just talking about making a transition in our last map break. So you create this thing in motion, then publish it. And now it's available in Final Cut. So there's no dynamic linking. Look, that's that's a feature that Apple is very, very well aware that people want. Um, whether they do something about it or not, we, we don't know. But it's not like they have never heard that before. And I, honestly, I agree with you. I think it would be really handy to cut. It would be handy to have a dynamic linking feature. Uh, I just think it would. Um, so that's my two cents. <clears throat> one, one more comment, because they, they're asking about how to move from, from After Effects to Final Cut. And uh, West Plate did come out with a product in the past, it, it, within the last year or two, mm -hmm. specifically for moving projects from Final Cut Pro 10 into After Effects. Uh, that retains everything in Final Cut. So you can build a complex timeline in After Effects and in, in Final Cut and bring it to After Effects. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the name right now and I did a quick search and, and couldn't locate it, but I'll find that and and post it in here. So you can you can move between Final Cut Pro and After Effects with uh, this product that Wes Plate uh, made, um, I think before he, he joined Apple. Um, All right, so yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember what it was. It, it'll send your layers from Final Cut over to Motion is really what it does. That's yeah, all it yeah. Does. It doesn't well, go back oh, the other oh, way. To After Effects, not to Motion. To After right, Effects. Right. To After Effects, correct. Right. Yeah, but it wasn't go back the other way. Yeah, maybe somebody will post and they move if they know it there. Hey, Big Water uh, Content Innovation. Boy, I'd love to have people's names, but Big Water. Hey, thank you very much for the contribution. Very much appreciated. Can you talk about fusion compared to motion? <laughs> That's a really, really interesting question. So I, I've been uh, doing a lot of deep dive into fusion recently, have a new fusion tutorial out there really focused on people who are using DaVinci Resolve for editing or color correction or interested in how they can leverage the Fusion page in Resolve for doing motion graphics and visual effects. And I think it's really useful. So one comment is that if you're already in the Resolve world for color correction, Fusion is a good alternative, uh, a good option for you for visual effects and motion graphics. If you're really in the Final Cut world, um, I think motion is excellent for motion graphics, and I don't see that Fusion has a huge advantage over motion in terms of motion graphics. In fact, motion's performance, its real-time playback performance, blows Fusion out of the water. It's just, it's so much better for doing kind of real-time design. Uh, Fusion's motion graphics tool set is deep. It's very good. You have to learn nodal compositing, which is very different. Um, so if you're in the world of Final Cut in motion, uh, I prefer motion specifically for, uh, sorry, I lost my, lost my so mic here. That was really good. While he, while, while he's finding his mic, uh, I'll answer this other question. Uh, Martin J, you asked about whether this had phantom power or not. It actually does. It has, it has phantom power. There's a battery in it. And that, in fact, um, it's a little switch sorry. right there. Say, so, yeah, that's fine. It'll switch right there. So I wanted to, I wanted to get that answer in while you were doing that. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. Lost, lost my, uh, 
<laughs> Very unprofessional. So, um, but anyway, Fusion is incredible. Um, and um, especially on the visual, well, on both sides. The performance is not great in terms of playback performance, but in terms of what you can do with it for visual effects, it, it's really great and has some features that, that Motion doesn't have, specifically around uh, planar tracking, 3D camera tracking, which is only available in the studio version, uh, paint cloning, paint cloning, uh, and and some true primitive 3D objects and camera projection. Uh, and I'm actually currently working on a new tutorial that talks about some of the 3D aspects of Fusion. So I love them both. I use Motion all the time when I'm doing stuff with Final Cut Pro, specifically for creating titles and transitions and that sort of thing. Uh, Fusion, on the other hand, I'm a little more focused on the visual effects side and some of the 3D aspects. Um, but I think they're both worthwhile. The thing about Fusion, it's a nodal-based compositor, and it can take a little while to wrap your head around that. So uh, that's why we have a tutorial for that. So uh, hopefully that answers that. Love, love yeah. Fusion. But there was actually another question earlier about um, about motion. I was uh, trying to find it. Oh yeah, Thomas Rodriguez, do you add additional LUT plugins? after Final Cut Pro 10 adds automatically, for instance, the Sony S-Log, uh, S-Gamut LUT. Maybe would you answer that, yeah. Mark? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say sometimes. Um, so the distinction is between a camera LUT and a creative LUT. So a camera LUT is a LUT that's created by the camera manufacturer with the intention of putting that clip, that shot in log, back into the Rec 709 color space so it looks like it did when it was shot. Um, and that LUT is often applied just so the clips look better in the timeline when you're editing. They can be used as your final output because it basically puts it back in the correct color space if you're going out to Rec. 709, which you are most of the time. So um, usually you're using that uh, uh, camera LUT initially to put that log clip back into Rec. 709 color space. Now on top of that, you can add a creative LUT and Funnel Cut has places for both of those. Maybe I should Instead of talking about that, I should just show it. Um, I don't think I have a clip up here, right? It, I don't have something immediately available uh, to show that, unfortunately, sorry. Um, but the creative LUT can be added on top. The, the camera LUT is, is applied automatically, Final Cut recognizes it, or you can apply it in the inspector. The creative, uh, the creative LUT is applied in the effects browser and you can add that on top of the camera LUT to create a basically a look to your footage that goes beyond how it looked when it was shot. And uh, I definitely do that. And there's plenty of creative LUTs you can download from anywhere from the internet from free, or you can buy packs of them and apply that on top. Uh, the, th the key thing to understand about creative LUTs is when you're applying them, were those creative LUTs designed to be applied to Rec. 709 footage or to log encoded footage? You need to know that um, because if it was designed to be applied to Rec. 709 footage, you definitely want that camera LUT applied first and then the creative LUT applied afterwards. If the creative LUT was designed to be applied to log footage, you apply it directly to that log clip without the uh, original camera LUT. So you would turn that off in Final Cut Pro. Um, and what I'll do while we're answering questions, if I have time, I'll try to bring up an example to show you or I'll show you next week. But uh, you can definitely use both uh, in, in together to create a look. Yeah, in fact, uh, while you were doing that, I, I searched out a tutorial that you did way back when. It's called Camera LUTs versus Creative LUTs. And I'm oh, just going to post. Yep, so I'm going to actually just post that link right in here. And you watch this. And you don't need to demo it, Mark, because it's right there. <laughs> All right, great. Good stuff. All right. Um, All right, good stuff. Good. Go ahead. All right, so there was a question that Don Miller asked way back, way back earlier. I want to get back. Don, uh, you asked about... Any comments on the lack of easy 5.7K 3D 180 support within Final Cut 10? Um, there is no 180 support, as far as I'm aware, in Final Cut Pro 10. Um, I know there are people that want it. 180 is becoming kind of the big, the big new thing now because with 180 you don't have to worry about hiding the camera crew, right? When you're shooting 360, you have to like get out of the way and you don't want the camera crew in there. 180 is be it's kind of making a lot of inroads. So. I haven't really shot any 180 stuff, and uh, I, mean, I get that question, and I just Final Cut Pro doesn't support it. But you know, someone out there can prove me wrong or say no, I use this. Go ahead and uh, mention it. But that's the that's the extent of my understanding with 180 and Final Cut right now. Okay, um, good. Let's see here. So I just I'll, uh, so I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, go so ahead. So <laughs> while, while we're, well, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, while we're, while you're looking at other questions, I want to talk a little bit about NAB for a moment. Okay, so National Broadcasters Convention. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and uh, switch over to my, let's see here. I have it up here. So NAB is the big broadcasters convention. It happens every April, and it happens in Las Vegas. And it's really the show to go to for learning about new gear, lights, camera technology, you know, editing, uh, what have you. So let me go ahead and close that. So I just brought it to the landing page here. And how this affects you or affects us is that we, Mark and I both teach at this thing called the um, post-production world. And by the way, there should be a link in the description below. And we're actually teaching at um, there in April and we're teaching on Apple and there's all, there's more than just editing stuff. There's camera stuff, there's business stuff, there's, um, there's stuff on, on lighting and directing and drones and 360. It's a huge conference with just tons and tons of information. And normally, um, well not normally, if you were gonna go pay for this, it's like 1200 bucks. It's $1,195. $1, now I just talked to Leah at the show organizer and she's, she's giving uh, away a free pass to this post-production uh, world event. Now, in the link below, in the in the comments below, you'll see a link. And if you go, if you click that link, you'll be taken here where you can enter your name and email and enter to win this. If you're going to NAB, if not, then why enter? But if you are going and you want to enter, you can you can do that. And I, I should point out that this email is only for this. We're not using the email for any other purpose. It's only to essentially gather emails for a raffle. And then uh, we'll go ahead and announce the winner uh, next week. If you are going to uh, NAB and uh, maybe you uh, would like to catch one of our classes, I I'm teaching one on audio. Mark's teaching one on organization. I think he's teaching one on uh, or, um, color correction. Based, color, color, correction. color correction. Right. I'm teaching one on motion graphics. Here's what's cool. If you are going and you don't, you know, maybe you don't win, but you still want to take one of our classes. Here's a secret. Here it is. Ready? You can go there and take one of our classes. All you have to do is go up to the booth and mention Steve or Mark, and they'll get, they'll let you into any one of the classes of your choice. So if you do happen to be going there, it's something that's kind of cool. So you can, uh, you go to the grid, you go to this grid, find out which class you want to go to, and then just show up and just say, Steve or Mark, and then they'll give you a pass. Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I've, I, I've never heard that before. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Anyway. That's great. So, yeah. hey, I wanted to. That's great. Um, so Jean, uh, Jean de de, boy, some of these names are hard. Jean de Blois, um, you said next week we travel to Spain in our an RV for six to eight weeks for filming and editing. I take only my iPad with LumaFusion, and that's cool. So I know Steve uses LumaFusion on the iPad, and my brand new DJI Osmo Pocket. So that sounds cool, and we'd love to uh, see what you come up with, uh, John. So please let us know afterwards. Uh, very interested in that DJI Osmo Pocket. Um, seems like a very uh, cool product and very discreet and easy to travel with. So let us know. It's very awesome. All right, so we're winding down. We're at, uh, I think, like seven minute mark or what have you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, hey, thank and, you, Mark Tyson. And Bradimus, thank you. Thank you for that contribution. There's a question about, hi guys, when you, uh, this is P Weeks 123, uh, when you import captions, is there a way to import them to a place in the timeline and not at the beginning by default? Um. I'd have to test it, but I think it's always using a starting, the zero starting time code of the timeline. Um, yeah, unless so, you're importing them with time code, yeah, and then they'll, they'll go exactly where they're supposed to. Yeah, exactly. So the question is, are you using, are you importing them using time code? Um, I have to, I have to play with that a little bit more. So I'm a little, little fuzzy. So I don't, I don't want to be like definitive. No, it doesn't. Cause then, you know, you guys all take me to task and say, no, here's why you're wrong. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, let's see. Any other questions? Um, okay. Yeah, here's a good, here's a good one. Um, 
Uh, when adding a vector image as a connected clip in Final Cut Pro 10, how can you keep the quality? It always seems blurry after render or export. So um, I, I would just render that, I would address that in a couple ways. If, if, it's, a, if it's scaled over 100%, it's gonna look blurry unless you take advantage of a little trick uh, using motion. And I'll, I'll look up the episode that we did about that where you can make vectors in Final Cut Pro basically be infinitely scalable uh, by turning, essentially turning on continuous rasterization to allow that to happen in Final Cut. Um, otherwise, you just can't scale it over 100%. It should not look blurry if you're not scaling it over 100%. So I'd have to take a look and see what's going on with that. But I will uh, post a link to that episode around about how you can work with vector artwork in Final Cut and scale it without losing quality, because that's a really useful thing to be able to do. So Scenes of Vermont, explain a good workflow for editing over capture 360. Okay, let me just, let me answer that very quickly because nine times out of 10, people are not understanding that in order for this to work, you have to create a standard definition project like HD, then put the equal rectangular clip into it. And then you could use the orient control to, to, to move around the sphere and do your, and do your over capture, whatever, whatever term you wanna use. But the key is you have to make an HD project. It won't work if you put it in a 360 project. And usually when I say that, like, oh, okay, great. So that, that answers that question. Um, so in terms of, um, oh, I wanted to show you our this week's special. So if you want to uh, cut to my screen for a second, um, Travis. So we've been talking a lot about audio and music today. And someone, a couple of you asked about GarageBand. We have this product uh, that teaches you how to work with GarageBand and Final Cut Pro together, not only to make music, but to do mixes and all kinds of things. I don't know, custom soundtracks. Um, we're offering this week's special. This, this tutorial is 40% off, and uh, Travis is bringing up the code there on the screen. And so, actually, we'll come back here. And so the thing is, if you use GarageBand, it's free and you don't need to use Logic, you can do a ton of stuff with GarageBand. And that's a, that's a great tutorial recommend. We have a great price on it, so I wanna, wanna check that out. All right, so we have like a few more minutes to cover last, any last minute questions here. Yeah, I just wanna just shout out, thank you Shane uh, and Jeff Taylor for your uh, contributions, very much appreciated. Uh, let's see, does the timeline need to have only video? Can it be only audio track with beat markers and then all the final selected clips over the audio track? Sure, that's fine. I think what Preet was asking is, does the primary storyline need to have only video? So a very legitimate way of editing is to, especially a music video, is to put audio, the song you're cutting to, as the primary storyline and then connect video clips to specific beats on that audio clip. Um, it's a longer discussion because as you get further along, you may want to switch uh, the arrangement and move all those video clips down to the primary storyline, but there's no reason you can't have audio be in your primary storyline. Usually you think of the primary storyline as the thing that's driving your story. So that may be an interview or it may be uh, audio in that place of a, in, in the terms of music video. So you can definitely you do it away. Out, yeah, you want to check out last week's episode and go to the links because I cover how to deal with audio with gap clips and music. Uh, where you put it, you, where you uh, lift it from the primary store and use gap clips to cut. You might want to check that out. It's a, mm -hmm. it's the way I do it, and it's not maybe the only way, but I, I really like this method. So, episode four, check that out. Um, Robert, Rosar, Robert, it's good to see you. I know you're uh, setting up a live stream, and you're correct. Our Black Magic outputs at 720, but it's going through uh, OBS and coming out at 1080. So. Yes, it is a limitation of the box, but that's one of the reasons why we're window. One of the reasons why we're windowing each other, um, and also because it looks just weird having two big, huge heads side by side yeah. on the screen. Um, but we think the Blackmagic Web Presenter at 720 looks really, really good. And when it's when he it's, says it looks great. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm no complaints. At, uh, no complaints there. Um, so one minute left. Is there any other questions we want to answer? To, in the last minute, see, let's see, um, does a time, okay, you answered that yep. one. Does FCP, Shane asking, does FCP have or might have in the future a way to embed marker data in the clips themselves? So if a clip is used in a new library, the marker data will show up. 
No, but you might want not not built in the app, but what you really might want to check out producer's best friend. Mm, I think it creates it'll take all your markers and spit them out as XML data or even like in a spreadsheet that you I'd have to test this that you might be able to bring back in. Um, again, it's fuzzy to me, but I think there's probably a way to do it using a third party. I just need to do a little bit yeah. more research. But you could also drag yeah. you could drag all those clips into the other library. Yeah. Um, yeah. And those yeah. markers would re remain. Yep, that's that's the easy way to do it. I'm always looking for the hard way to do it, Mark. I'm always like, oh, it's like the hard way to do it. <laughs> uh, all right. right. Well, I think I think, I think we're good. So we just want to thank you guys for joining us again this week. Uh, thank you for your questions. We really enjoy doing the show. Um, thank you for all who donated for the super chat and for those of you who are going to purchase our tutorial. Um, the GarageBand tutorial, the one I just mentioned, it really helps us underwrite the show and do this every week. We put a lot of work into prepping it and, and making sure that you're happy with it. Um, hey, if you guys are interested in like maybe seeing some other stuff, maybe some some guests or something else, uh, please let us know in the comments. Say, look, I'd like to see an episode on this mm -hmm. or maybe you can cover that. Um, this is really about making the best show that, that you find the most value in. So put that in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Um, Additionally, we are working on a number of different tutorials that are going to be coming out shortly, and uh, you'll have to watch for those. Let's see what else. NAB coming up if you're going. Uh, we'd love to see you at the Faster Together event at the Rio on Tuesday night. We're going to have a, we're going to be there in, with an iMac or some sort of a computer, and you'll be able to interface with us live, and that'll be, a, that'll be a lot of fun. We can hang out together and just have a beer and just talk, so we'll look forward to that. All right, so that was a long-winded outro. Just want to thank you again for joining <laughs> us this week's Rip Live episode episode five. We'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. See you guys later. <laughs>